Hi everybody. Uh, so in this recording, I will look into how um, uh, formal methods and reinforcement learning could work together and uh, help develop uh, verifiable reinforcement learning algorithms. And uh, this is one way of abstractly studying uh, how um, the recent developments in learning and reinforcement learning could provide alternative means for uh, a number of functionalities in, in cyber physical systems, but on the other hand, uh, these new techniques uh, don't yet put the, the necessary emphasis on the uh, safety or correctness of the, uh, on the, of the resulting behavior, and, uh, and it is questionable whether uh, they can work with uh, realistic amounts of data given the fact that uh, cyber physical systems and autonomous systems are actually they, they have physical embodiment and there might be limitations on on how much data we can um, generate uh, for training and learning purposes especially given that uh, they are to work in dynamic environments uh, and, um, and and not necessarily everything in the environment is going to cooperate uh, with us for uh, observing these systems uh, for uh, training and learning purposes so on one side, learning offers opportunities. On the other side, uh, whether we can uh, verify the safety of the resulting behavior and uh, whether the data requirements are realistic. That's the, 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 the tension between these two ends. And what I'm going to do is, as I said, I will use reinforcement learning. It, 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 this interaction between formal methods and learning could uh, play in many different forms. I'm going to look into that in the, in the, in the context of reinforcement learning. And reinforcement learning is essentially there is a learner, a robot, a system uh, uh, that works in an environment and there are certain things that it does not know yet it needs to uh, it needs to operate in the environment. So typically it is a back and forth between what happens in the environment and the learner. The learner takes an action, something happens in the environment, the learner gets to see what's happened and, and it may also uh, get a thumbs up or thumbs down uh, from some entity uh, that guides the learning process for the learner. And obviously this is the highest level cartoonish explanation of reinforcement learning and there could be uh, many different variants of this. And it, 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 has, it offers a lot of cap uh, capabilities and the, the success stories um, are in um, are expanding uh, pretty quickly. Uh, on the other hand, uh, still uh, there, the, 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 it is possible that a learning enabled uh, functionality actually can um, uh, behave in ways that are obviously not acceptable uh, given the safety criticality of many of uh, cyber physical systems and autonomous systems. We have to think twice uh, whether we understand the resulting functionality properly or not. And to this end, let us introduce um, a new uh, piece of problem data. Let, let us modify the problem a tiny bit. We will introduce a temporal logic specification and ask the question of whether the learned behavior satisfies the specification. It could be a safety specification, it could be something else that we care about. We will ask whether uh, the system, the resulting learned behavior is going to satisfy the specifications. Or a little harder, not a little bit, significantly harder and more interesting question is that actually whether e even dur during learning in the, in the phase that the system does not know certain things which might actually become uh, critical for, for the safety properties, uh, whether we can actually keep the system safe while ensuring that it figures out those things that it does not yet know. So that is, this is the this is the rough problem description I'm going to look into uh, in, the, in the rest of these slides. There is a very closely related method, so-called inverse reinforcement learning, and in the later parts I'm going to touch on that, where an expert essentially shows what acceptable behavior is, and then the, uh, the learner out of these demonstrations tries to figure out how to operate. And specifications in this context will come in in a slightly different way, uh, but um, they will offer similar, uh, they will offer similar um, utility. So with that, let me now just move into one sample problem. Uh, it's not necessarily the most um, 
most uh, recent or most realistic setting, but it is going to be a way to for us to put uh, concepts from formal methods and concepts from uh, reinforcement learning together. So we have given is a Markov decision process, and we know the structure, we know what transitions exist, and we but we, we may not know the transition function, we may not know the transition probabilities. So the transition probability matrix is unknown. Again, we know the structure. Uh, that assumption could be removed, but let's say we know if we do. And we, we are given a temporal logic specification as well. And we are asked to synthesize a strategy F, um, and uh, it's going to obviously choose the actions for the, uh, for the learning agent such that we will maximize the probability of satisfying the specifications. There's no additional reward in this, in this, in this first setting. We want to maximize the satisfaction. We want to learn something that maximizes the uh, satisfaction, uh, the probability of satisfying the specifications. And since we don't know the transition probabilities, there's going to be some sort of trial and error or learning is going to take place. And we want this thing to be efficient in some classical sense, which is the pack sense, probably approximately correct sense. It's going to be, uh, so uh, uh, we, will, we will not have, so we, we probably won't be able to get the optimal policy. So we want to be near optimal. And we will probably not be totally confident in what we will get. So we want some high confidence and roughly, probably, and approximately to uh, refer to those two things. And then we don't want to that, that this thing take, take forever. We, we, we want to be able to have a bound on that. Uh, we can do this near optimality and high confidence with some uh, with, with amount of time and samples uh, that are polynomial in the key par parameters of the problem. Uh, so uh, we want to have a polynomial bound on, on the learning effort. So this is the problem that we will look into. And, uh, and the first insight from formal methods comes right away that uh, instead of uh, trying to look into the system and the specifications, we will obviously um, transform this thing to a product automaton, a an automaton that represents the specifications. We'll take the product. Uh, we know the structure. We don't know the transition probabilities, but that's fine. And the resulting uh, system is going to be yet another uh, Markov decision process, but now uh, certain parts of that Markov decision process will be unknown. And in, instead of uh, monitoring uh, the specifications, we will just look into whether certain special states, obviously, uh, in this product automaton uh, or in this product MDP will be visited or uh, with what uh, probability they will be visited. So we will transform it to a uh, product system and we will then use uh, roughly existing learning techniques uh, on this product system. And uh, so the solution which is adopted from uh, the so-called E3 algorithm in reinforcement learning uh, uh, looks just f follows this uh, this flow. So we we won't know the M, the mark of decision process, but at each step we will have an estimate on it. And let's call it M bar. And we have a specification. Then, given m bar and the specification, we can go and compute a strategy f using standard techniques that we have seen earlier in the week. And then, um, then we will apply this strategy on the on the actual system, and we will see what happens. And during this process, we will see we will gather new data. And we will go and update our understanding of the underlying market decision process. We will update the estimated M. And this roughly looks into, I have, went, I have been to this state, I have taken this action, let me count what happens. I end up here, here, and here, 17 times 200 times, etc. That gives an estimate of the underlying transition, unknown transition probabilities. And then, um, and then we close the loop and repeat it uh, for, a, for a certain amount of times. So that's the how the flow works. And along this process, what happens? Uh, what happens is the following. So first of all, we will have known certain parts of the Markov decision process. Those are the parts for which we already have a relatively good estimate of the underlying unknown transition probabilities. Roughly, we can think this as that the parts of the state space at which we have been sufficiently many times and tried things sufficiently many times, and then the rest that we will lump into a single sync state. And then the first result is 
in the form of um, that the pulse that we compute over the known part of the product system is either near optimal, hence we can stop. We know that with this much of knowledge, uh, we can say that this policy is going to give high enough uh, probability for satisfying the underlying specifications, or it is going to explore. It's not going to get stuck. It is going to run into a new unknown state with non-zero probability. So we have either have seen enough that we are near optimal or we will see new things. All right. So this is the first step that says that it is not going to be in a case where either the probability is uh, too far from the uh, maximal probability or uh, we cannot see anything new. So that, that's, uh, that obviously is a, uh, a non-fruitful uh, uh, term. Uh, uh, status that we, we want to avoid and this theorem says that that's not going to happen you will either inch toward uh, the maximum probability or you are you are done and then the final the, the end result here is that uh, indeed we can by going through this loop uh, we can go and uh, with probability one minus delta delta is given some uh, small constants and epsilon is like that too. So with probable to uh, one minus delta, the resulting policy is going to satisfy this inequality here. So this one is the if we had known what the um, if we had known what the Markov decision process was, this was this is the maximal probable that we could have obtained, and this is uh, the probable that we achieve by the policy that we compute in each iteration. So eventually we will have this case that the gap between these two probabilities will be less than two epsilon and it is not going to so this is the approximately optimal part this is the uh, high confidence part and uh, we, the number of samples that we need or the number of steps that we will need is polynomial in the size of the Markov decision process size of this automaton that represents the specification it is t is the so-called epsilon state value mixing time for the optimal policy that is, that is a little bit, there's a little bit commonly used cheating there but uh, so uh, uh, the, the, op, the end result depends on that constant as well uh, polynomially and the, uh, the, it also depends on the amount of confidence and amount of suboptimality that we can tolerate polynomially so this is pretty straightforward that observing that uh, we can uh, monitor with respect to the specifications by passing to a product automaton uh, with unknown elements in it and then go and apply the, a, a variant of an existing reinforcement learning algorithm and then establish similar bounds to on, on, on this over this product automaton and translate that back to that the specifications in the end result uh, will be satisfied uh, with um, a probability that's not too far from the optimum. Okay, so let's look at a little example. Um, so let me try to explain. We have a motion planning problem over a grid world. The objective is maximizing the probability of satisfying the specification here written in text, infinitely often visiting the green blocks, the green blocks that we see, uh, R1, R2, R3, in this order. Uh, and then never get into the red cells. And there are four different types of uh, terrain, and we, we, we don't know uh, what is where or what the uh, transition probabilities are. And this blue thing is the position of the system or the ro uh, robot or the agent that is uh, starting from a certain place and goes and explores and sees what happens and tries to find out the transition probabilities in these different regions. And based on that, at some point, it's going to stop. And uh, and then we can. This is not very informative animation. What we can see is that actually there is a little bit of a trade-off between how much suboptimality we can tolerate versus how much computation we need. If we are fine to be off by 0 0.01, then we have to run for a long time. And if we can tolerate being off by 0 0.05 the computation time reduces significantly and uh, a little comment here that the the time that we spent 
for synthesizing the policy over the estimated market decision process in that loop is actually the negligible part of it. The mo most of the time that I'm reporting here is essential the system is going and just bumping into things and taking actions and seeing what's happening. Essentially, the learning effort takes forever, whereas the, uh, the, uh, the synthesis over the estimated market decision process is uh, almost negligible time with respect to that uh, exploration effort. So, uh, fine, so just let me just now critique this results to, as a transition to some other set of results. So this is a, indeed actually a relatively rigorous framework that brings in the formal methods like ideas and reinforcement learning like ideas into a, um, into a setting. It is data efficient in a theoretical sense. We know that there's a polynomial bound on the effort that we need for learning. Yet, even in this relatively uh, small example, learning may take forever. And, and not only that, but these specifications are satisfied with high probability only at convergence. And if you look at the, uh, the animation in the previous slide, we would have seen closely, we would have seen that uh, actually sometimes this uh, system goes and uh, visits the red cells that we want to avoid during training. And uh, not too surprising because the underlying, um, the underlying um, transition probabilities are unknown and we only ask that at convergence the uh, specification is satisfied with high probability. So this is, this is roughly the good part and there are, there are not so good parts. The, the theoretical efficiency may not be uh, sort of practically useful because we, we will be working with relative like, physical systems most of the time, uh, cyber physical systems and, 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 and autonomous systems. Trying things million times or billion times in, in, a physical, in the physical world is not going to be uh, effective there. And also, uh, as I said, uh, high probability at convergence is, may not be acceptable. If, if my system dies before it learns, that learning uh, is not going to be that useful. So we want to keep the system safe and explore to the extent that it's possible. So I'm going to now go through a couple of different ideas that had been explored uh, for essentially motivated by these two limitations. One is that, so uh, this, is, this is an extension of the previous results where now the system description is a turn-based stochastic book game and the transition probabilities are unknown. We have a reward now. The reward is unknown as well. So it is not only while we are uh, running in the system, not only uh, maximizing the satisfaction probability of the specifications, but along with that, let's also satisfy the, let's also maximize the reward that the system collects, but the reward is unknown at various states. Uh, and actually, the, the problem statement or the, the statement of the end result is going to be uh, slightly different than that, and I'm going to come to that uh, in a second. Uh, we also have a discount factor. The rewards that I collect now are more important than those in the future. And similarly, we have this epsilon and delta for suboptimality and confidence. So now it is actually not maximizing the, uh, it is not trying to maximize the satisfaction probability. Instead, what we will end up having is an almost sure winning, almost surely the specification will hold uh, with probability, sorry. With probability one, the specification will hold, and the system is going to behave epsilon suboptimally, perhaps initially, uh, but it is not going to be uh, for too long. There's going to be, the end result is that there is a memoryless strategy with probability no less than one minus delta with high confidence. It's going to be almost surely safe or almost surely satisfying the specification. And it will all behave possibly suboptimally up to a level of uh, uh, more than epsilon suboptimally only initially, and that initial fragment is not is going to be bounded uh, by a polynomial that is a uh, that's uh, that's a function of the size of the state space, size of the automaton that we have for uh, underlying automaton. Uh, sorry, uh, this is um, the size of the the game already captures this. 
Uh, so the size of the state space, size of the action set, and uh, related to the level of confidence and level of suboptimality that we want to tolerate. So to some extent, this takes away this tension that we may actually not satisfy the specifications and die before we learn uh, with further assumptions and, uh, and changing the problem a little bit. This says that this result is not subject to that criticism. It is going to be safe or it's going to satisfy the specifications almost surely with high probability at all times. And that part is obviously is going to relate to the fact that we know the underlying uh, structure. We don't know the transition probabilities, we don't know the rewards, but we know the structure in this game. And that part is going to be uh, leveraged for this first piece. And the unknown rewards and unknown transition probabilities will be morphed into that uh, we may behave suboptimally, but not for too long. Okay, so this is this is one uh, one um, one fix for uh, for the criticism that I had in the previous slide, and also I should have a couple of comments on that. Uh, the problem that we are uh, I am trying to motivate uh, by this slide that we want we want to be able to do things in unknown systems. We want to be able to save. We want to be able to be efficient. Likely that that that. The objective that I'm setting is not achievable in the in, in, in a general setting. Hence, uh, the the effort has been focusing on hey, let's look at into various versions of this of of this of this uh, objective, and this one is uh, get, making progress toward that in a in a in, in one setting that is obviously narrower than the general objective. Another approach uh, that has been uh, looked into and uh, is attracting more and more interest is this, this uh, safety through shielding, and this is definitely motivated by the uh, by the sh shielding work over the last five to ten years in formal methods and asking how it can be utilized for reinforcement learning purposes. So this is the flow of reinforcement learning that I showed early on. Now what's going to happen is we will cut the flow and say, look, the, the learner might take an action, but we'll introduce a runtime shield that's going to get that's going to see the action. It also may have access to the observations, and it is going to get to modify the actions, and then uh, the modified action is going to be implemented in the environment, and then uh, then the rest is closed in a similar way. And this runtime shielding approach uh, is desired, and in some techniques it is actually probably achieved, that it's going to be corrective with respect to the spe underlying specifications. And not necessarily a very general family of specifications, but for the safety fragment of te linear temporal logic, definitely uh, there's quite a bit of uh, work. So we want them to be correct, in, in the sense that the learner might take actions that were to violate the specifications, but the modified actions, when they are implemented, we don't want this, this resulting behavior in the environment to violate the safety specifications. Uh, so correctiveness could have been achieved uh, by just overwriting every single action of the learner, and that's definitely not what we want. And we want this, these corrective actions to be minimal interfering, interfere only when uh, a violation was going to be unavoidable and and as soon as you fix these things uh, return the authority back to the learner so that uh, the learner can do whatever what it was supposed to do to take advantage of uh, exploring the world and uh, extracting um, extracting performance out of that perhaps and uh, to, a, to a great extent these techniques are uh, they do not refer to the inner workings of the learning algorithm, they just look into the, uh, the input-output relations, hence they actually are agnostic to the underlying learning algorithms. And there are ways to extend them to uh, function approximation based methods for learning even. Uh, that is a, uh, essentially that is trying to allude to that uh, we can use these techniques with, uh, with learning algorithms that represent the underlying unknown uh, elements using, for example, neural networks. And um, if the underlying learning algorithm uh, has some theoretical properties, for example, some convergence properties, uh, we don't often have these things, but some more conventional learning algorithms, reinforcement learning algorithms, have 
convergence guarantees. We want the shielded version to obviously preserve some of these uh, those guarantees. Uh, it is not the shielding is the shielded learning is not necessarily going to converge to what the original learning algorithm was going to converge to because it may be not possible even. But we want these things to converge to the constrained optimal behavior. Again, this doesn't happen too often because the baseline learning techniques do not necessarily have this property, but if they do, and in some cases, uh, the shielded learning has been able to preserve the properties. And also, uh, it turns out that by um, an interesting manner of restricting the exploration space, shielded learning has been uh, has uh, demonstrated uh, some empirical increase in the data efficiency for learning. So how shield synthesis works is uh, roughly described by this flow. Let me open these things. So essentially, it relies on a violation monitor that is going to monitor whether the underlying system, the learner, is to violate the specifications. And if it is, if it is the case, then uh, the violation monitor uh, goes and tr keeps track of the all possible executions that could have avoided the violation of the specifications. And uh, then it, the deviation monitor uh, uh, keeps track of uh, once the shield actually you know, starts de deviating from the learner's uh, directives, uh, it uh, looks into how much the deviation is and it keeps track of that. This element here solves a safety game and essentially uh, it computes a permissive strategy or a safety game that ensures that the when the, the resulting strategy, permissive strategy from this game, uh, when it is implemented on top of the learner, the resulting behavior is going to satisfy the safety specifications. So this ensures the correctness. And the last element ensures by solving another game uh, that is uh, obtained by essentially putting this uh, permissive strategy on top of the underlying, the initial game that we had, uh, it ensures that uh, the shield is not going to forever mess up with the operation of the learner, but at some point, as soon as possible, it is going to, uh, once it corrects the behavior, it is going to give the authority back to the, to the learner. And then overall, uh, we, by composing properly the, the, these elements that we have, we obtain this shield. A couple of examples here. Uh, so this is a simple example, actually. Uh, this car is trying to figure out how to uh, drive around the circuit, and it's going to use a uh, reinforcement learning algorithm uh, with uh, the pop. I, I believe the policy is represented as a three-layer neural network. Uh, and on the left, uh, this this animation shows um, the learning process without shielding, and this one shows with shielding. And let me go back and come back, uh, come to this. Essentially, it is a random exploration here and there. And then for uh, without shielding, uh, after 40 minutes of training and 1600 crashes, uh, it doesn't seem like that the learner actually have figured out uh, what it's supposed to do, which is going around the circuit. Uh, whereas uh, within one minute of training, and no crashes because the shield actually ensures that they do not exist. As you can see, the, the, the shielded version has figured out a way to go around the circuit. And what happens is essentially the shield without allowing for, for crashes, uh, it gives a little bit of a better chance to uh, proceed uh, in, the, in the direction uh, in which the uh, learner can gather rewards for uh, doing things properly in this case going around this at least once. As soon as you go around this at least once, uh, you start seeing um, rewards. And that's going to reinforce your understanding of what you are probably supposed to do. Uh, whereas this one never actually, uh, in this in this one training uh, episode, it, it never uh, finishes this, uh, it goes around the circuit and it, it never achieves to see a single reward. Um, so, what we have observed is that indeed uh, merging ideas from formal methods and reinforcement learning 
uh, has a tremendous utility when uh, for these systems where the reward is delayed or the tasks for, for completing which uh, the system gets a reward um, has this extended horizon or temporally extended tasks are harder to learn uh, because the rewards are relatively sparse and uh, guidance from uh, ideas uh, gu guidance from uh, for, uh, formal methods based ideas are relatively useful uh, for such learning tasks and um, and here I show uh, a, a Pac-Man example where we're a small uh, grid world uh, others have probably uh, much larger uh, examples and with um, increasing number of uh, ghosts in, in a Pac-Man example but what we see here is that the shielded version never gets eaten hence it actually not only gets a more score uh, but it figures out how to do things uh, much more effectively than uh, the non-shielded version where uh, the, uh, the Pac-Man gets eaten pretty often. Uh, okay so this is one way of looking into it and another question now I'm going to ask and I'm switching now uh, to the second part where whether we can actually make learning more efficient by incorporate by, by through connections between uh, formal methods and, and, and reinforcement learning and the setting is the following can we have two tasks a source task and a target task task is going to now have uh, this time temporal logic uh, like setting and um, and the, that language had been uh, picked for this line of work mostly for uh, so that the uh, inference that comes inferring uh, temporal logic specifications from demonstrations uh, to, to facilitate that step. But essentially what happens is we have we have these yellow region, yellow region, green region, green region. They are at different places, they look different. Uh, there is uh, some time aspect of these specifications um, but what we see here is that um, these the tasks on the two sides seem similar to each other structurally they are similar the exact timing is different there's a region the region's place is different the size is different blah blah but there is some similarity between these two tasks so the question is whether we can actually take advantage of this similarity uh, by the source task is there is uh, there is you you learn in the source task and then the question is now if we were to learn in a new in a new environment for a new tasks whether we can take advantage of the similarity and the fact that we have already taken the pain of learning in the source task it is essentially whether we can have transfer of capability from from left to right in this picture and what's going to happen is again as I said we will learn on this site while doing it as we gather data we will infer specifications and the similarity between these specifications the logical similarity we did this slide calls it is going to give us confidence that we should be able to take advantage of what we have learned in the sorry in this in the in the source task and then make the learning in the target task more efficient in the in the sense of using the use of data and um, so I'm, I'm not going to be able to get into the what happens in each step of these things uh, but uh, let me look at an example so the source task and uh, the target task are shown here and I show I show you four learning um, examples in the target task. The first one uses the so-called Q-learning algorithm with no more guidance. And the optimal behavior here is gathering this cumulative reward of 100. And the Q-learning algorithm does a couple of things here and it then starts to increase, uh, but the increase is way too slow and if you run this for millions of steps, the, it is just going to inch toward uh, the higher but it will never get to the optimal behavior. Whereas now, if we, if we, we will have inferred these specifications, right? We now um, extend the state space by incorporating the specification. 
And then also there are multiple different ways of inferring the different metrics for how well the inference of these specifications from the data is. And if we use as a metric the maximum classification rate uh, in the in the in the mixed um, not mixed uh, metric inter interval temporal logic in, uh, specifications, what we see is that this per, uh, this pink curve. A couple of things here. One is that the, the, in the initial, I believe, ten thousand steps here, the pink curve actually stays zero because those initial episodes, initial runs. Uh, the, 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 this method uses for establishing whether there is a logical similarity between what we had seen in the source task and this in this new target task. Why it is established, and there are uh, there are ways to, uh, proposed for uh, concluding that there is sufficient similarity. Then it starts collecting reward, and what we see is that it uses the first ten thousand steps for establishing logical similarity and then once there is a logical similarity it actually inches toward the optimal level much faster than what we see in the black curve and if for inference a different metric is used but what is called this informativeness of the resulting um, mixed into, uh, sorry metric internal temporal logic specifications we obtain this blue thing so again initially there's nothing but then it just goes toward the optimal behavior and in this case it actually gets pretty close to the optimal behavior and then uh, this this last piece is uh, it is also taking the low level learned objects, the reward representations, etc., and using it as a warm start for learning the target and uh, task. Uh, the long story short is that uh, with a little bit more effort on trying to establish this logical similarity uh, by using uh, uh, ideas from formal methods, in this setting one can make actually learning in a new environment significantly uh, more effective and efficient data efficient than uh, it would have been if it tried to learn uh, from scratch more optimal much more data efficient and 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 it is using the underlying similarity between the tasks that are captured in 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 variants of temporal logic uh, specifications so the last piece i'm going to get into is um, essentially this inverse reinforcement learning and uh, let me not spend too much time on it and just tell you what the main idea is the main idea is somebody shows you what to do somehow a human walks somebody controls a car a teacher shows a robot what to do bunch of demonstrations and in this case these are the demonstrations that we have and and from these demonstrations you call you run inverse reinforcement learning which is essentially from the demonstrations and a given a, uh, a markov decision process you try to come up with a reward function initially unknown and you try to construct that in such a way that the policy that uh, optimizes with respect to this reward function is going to mimic the expert demonstrations that is the that is the that is the metric for this inverse problem and what we, I'm going to call inverse reinforcement learning, but with high-level task information as side information is going to put temporal logic specifications into this mix. It is not only the demonstrations, but it's also that we know every possible demonstration would have satisfied some given specifications. It says here that every possible demonstration would never come to these red cells here, right? And it would go to these green cells in certain ways and eventually go to this uh, yellow cell. And another way of thinking about this is, let's say this is somebody's driving behavior, and this is the driver's handbook. There is no reason whatsoever trying to figure out what the driver's handbook, every sane driver would have followed from the demonstrations of driving, right? So how can we feed these things and learn something that not only mimics the demonstrations, not only tries to create behavior that would look similar around where we have these demonstrations, but also satisfies the uh, this, these, these tasks, uh, the side information or the specifications that we use to capture this, the, the, the underlying knowledge with high probability. And, and uh, this slide shows essentially a way of solving the resulting problem. The resulting problem is, uh, has typically roughly two pieces. This initial part describes 
um, how to parameterize the underlying unknown reward functions and how to obtain an optimal policy out of it, a randomized policy. And, uh, and uh, the, um, here, the, the objective is maximizing the, picking the parameters theta that represent the uh, reward function in such a way that the resulting behavior is going to um, generate, uh, uh, the, the resulting policy is going to, which is this, the resulting policy is going to generate behavior in the Markov decision process M that looks similar to the demonstrations D and uh, the, we encode the optimality through the, uh, the Bellman equations as constraints here. And the, um, the underlying, um, the, the modification is going to be now, I, I don't know how to erase these things, let me just. Uh, okay, the modification is in the following way. In addition to now the Bellman equation, the optimality conditions are over the product space again, the mark of decision process, and then the automaton corresponding to the underlying the specifications that capture the knowledge that we have. Um, and in addition to that, we keep track of whether the specifications are violated and we penalize in the objective function. All right, so just we penalize violating these, the, the specifications in addition to being uh, similar to in it, uh, being similar to the underlying demonstration. So there's going to be a trade-off between being similar and while, uh, satisfying the specifications. And it turns out that there are a couple of neat properties that we can get. This left side does not use any side information, the right side uses. And, and yellow is probability one or high probability of satisfying the specifications starting from the states show. What we see that actually, obviously these starting from the obstacles, we cannot satisfy the specifications, we will already violate the specifications and hence we are low probability, these are not surprising here. But from then many other places, especially this top right corner, we also violate the specifications if we don't use the side information, if we just use the plain manual outcome of the inverse reinforcement learning. Not surprising because if we go back, we see that we don't have data from those regions. Nothing has been seen. The inverse reinforcement learning has no idea what's going on. And, 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 and then therefore actually it is going to violate specifications with high probability. When we incorporate side information as we do, uh, as we, I, I showed, then we have yellow from everywhere but the, um, but the obstacles. And that means that actually uh, from any state, uh, depending, uh, no matter whether we have seen data in those states or not, we will satisfy the specifications with high probability. So th this is good for satisfying the specifications. The next question is, is this actually at the expense of not creating behavior that looks like the demonstrations. And it turns out that it is not. This is uh, with the relative weight between the similarity to demonstrations and satisfying specifications. Uh, we can create very low probability of satisfying specifications versus very high probability of satisfying the specifications. So this is the relative weight. And there is a level of weight where we can get high satisfaction probability and also around that, uh, where we have uh, we have high satisfaction probability, the similarity to the underlying demonstrations is not almost at all different from the similarity to the two demonstrations or any other relative weight that we have. Hence, uh, in this one example at the least, uh, the significantly better test satisfaction probability does not necessarily come uh, with a sacrifice of not uh, making the user happy or not being similar to what the user or what the expert had shown as demonstrations in inverse reinforcement learning. Uh, so with that, I'm going to actually wrap up here. <coughs> I wanted to just comment on why we should care about the, the ideas in the, at the interface of formal methods and learning. And, my reasoning, it is evolving, but it goes as follows. Learning, we, we, cannot be, we cannot say that we will not use learning in one way or other. It is gonna come into uh, cyber physical systems or autonomous systems. But uh, learning based techniques are no way reliable to be used for autonomy or in general, even in engineering. And 
what I think is this main bottleneck is not necessarily underlying ideas are bad, it's just the specifications are nowhere. It just, we cannot talk about verifiability, we cannot talk about safety, we cannot talk about reliability, assurance, whatever is just the right buzzword out there is. We cannot talk about that stuff without first giving clear specifications of what it's going to mean. And to me, this is the biggest uh, benefit that the, in, we can get from the interaction between formal methods and learning. And <coughs> formal specifications will not only tell us what we are trying to achieve, but they happen to be actually also pretty nice uh, representations, compact representations of uh, existing knowledge. And, and there's quite a bit of debate out there in learning just how to uh, incorporate existing knowledge and data and to come up with hybrid techniques. And again, there are uh, different types of buzzwords uh, for such representations and techniques. And very likely uh, that if we can take advantage of existing knowledge and incorporate that into learning, we can probably in improve the efficiency of these techniques and uh, in tr start talking about reliable to or trustworthiness of these techniques uh, much more confidently. And specifications, formal specifications, uh, giving us a way to translate our knowledge into algorithm development relatively uh, systematically is, I think, also a very nice uh, opportunity. And sometimes merely acknowledging that, hey, we need behavior specifications. We cannot tolerate daydreaming. We cannot tolerate just going and trying out something empirically. I had a hunch, let me just go and tweak my neural network in this way add one more layer, etc. That that's great if we can get performance out of it, but merely acknowledging that I need to specify the behavior, the desired behavior that I, then I can take with this behavior specification and incorporate my resulting learning algorithm into an engineering system. <coughs> Without the proper specifications, we cannot go and incorporate learning into a bigger engineering product. Merely that type of self-discipline might be actually a breakthrough. And on the flip side, um, Learning-based techniques, modern learning-based techniques seem to give um, efficient ways of manipulating uh, data and keeping track of what we had seen. And that might um, prove useful uh, for constructing approximate solutions or alternative approximate solutions for problems that we face, very hard problems we face in formal methods that are known to be hard. I am more willing to take a best effort empirically a best effort approximation that seems to be empirically working more, I am more easily to accept such a solution uh, if I know that an exact <coughs> complete and formal solution is uh, probably extremely hard uh, so that is the flip side of the coin and I know people are actually also exploring the connection between formal methods and learning uh, for those purposes as well so with this, I'm going to wrap up here and, and then we can discuss these things further. Thanks.